need to wonder that of all the people in the world, you, the honored members of the audience, have been selected today to be present here. And of all the people in the world, Mr. Ahmad Didat has been chosen to address you. Indeed, there is purpose in this, ladies and gentlemen. Purpose for all of us to reflect upon. What is the purpose of Mr. Ahmad Didat? In one word, education. It is his purpose, it is his desire to educate. And also, in so far as it can be proved to him that his submissions are incorrect to be educated. That is his purpose. It is with this in mind that we have extended an invitation to theologians, to qualified bishops from England to accept an invitation to debate matters with Mr. Ahmad Dilat, especially after negative sentiments were expressed in the newspapers about Mr. Dilat's debate with Dr. Anis Sharosh. It would appear from the fact of non-response that they are reluctant to accept the challenge or to accept the invitation. Therefore, what might have been a debate or a symposium will in fact be a lecture this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mohammed Salim Khan. I will be the chairman this evening and it is my pleasure to be associated with this gathering and with this symposium. The procedure will be the following. Mr. Ahmad Dirat will present his lecture, which will be a sequel of the debate that took place here yesterday which you have probably heard about. After which, you, the members of the audience, will be accorded an opportunity of directing questions at Mr. Ahmad Didat. And to that end, a microphone has been provided at the foot of the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker, who needs no introduction, Mr. Ahmad Didat. Say, He is Allah, the one and only, Allah Samad, God the eternal, absolute. He does not beget and is not begotten. And does nothing like unto Him. Right. What have you written? And the man would read it, he would check it, correct it's right. There was no fumbling. He was not now guessing he, like a man dictating a letter to his secretary and he said, no, 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 cut that out. 
at this, not like this, like that. Muhammad didn't do that. He was reading, dictating as if he was reading out of a book. And there was no book. Allah by wahi, by revelation, was giving him the messages, which he in turn was repeating as they were given to him. So Allah says, you were not in the habit before this wahi came to you, before Allah chose him as his messenger, he was not in the habit of doing such a thing. Nor were you able to transcribe with your right hand. You were not a literate person. You were also not in a position to read or write. In that case, had you been able to do that, if you were babbling all the time, talking, 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 and now you're talking the Quran, it could be understood. Or if he was writing, 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 if he was a learned man, reading previous scriptures, reading the Shastras, the Vedas and all that, philosophies of the ancient Greeks, and he could now dictate and rehash it, it would be quite a different thing. If he was used to talking like that before, and if he was used to writing, then in that case, Allah says, that the talkers of vanity, these babblers in the marketplaces, the hot, hot gospelers, these Bible thumpers, they would have had some reason to doubt that Muhammad, this is your handiwork. In your case, O Muhammad, they have not a, a stitch to have against you. That he was an ummi. Where did you find this? In the Quran, in Surah Ankabut. Where you find Ankabut? I was telling you yesterday, if you remember, if you were here yesterday, that if you have a translation like this particular one here, by Abdullah Yusuf Ali, at the back of this volume is an index. Ankabut under A, just like a dictionary, look for Ankabut and it will tell you chapter 29. Ankabut is chapter 29. I said verse number 48. Once you find 29, 48 is easy to find. Check it up. Check it up at home. Not that you doubt me or any learned man who gives you Quranic references. No, there's no question of doubt. But if you take this trouble of going and checking up, what you have heard, you refresh your memory and that part of that knowledge will become a part of you and you in turn will be able to share with others. You found that in Ankabut. If you want to find again in this Quran about our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa being an ummi, unlettered. Now look under M, Muhammad. See this, what everything that the Quran says about Muhammad and the M, and you'll find the unlettered, means unlettered, not educated. Where do you find that? It says chapter 7, Surah Araf, Araf, chapter 7, verse number 157, very easy to find. Chapter 7, verse 157. You will find the Quran testifies that the Holy Prophet Muhammad was an Ummi. And the enemies of Islam, the Westerner has been testifying to this fact. Thomas Carlyle. I mentioned this man yesterday in another context. Thomas Carlyle, one of the greatest thinkers of the past century. In 1840, he delivered a series of lectures in this country. Under the heading, Heroes and Hero Worship. And he chose our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa as his hero prophet. Muhammad was his hero prophet. Not David or Solomon or Moses or Jesus, but Muhammad. This Thomas Carlyle, he defends our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa against the charge that he was a literate person. He was acting as if he didn't know how to read or write. Thomas Carlyle says that he had no school learning talking about Muhammad sallallahu that he had no school learning of the thing we call school learning, none at all. Reverend Boswat Smith, in his book, Muhammad and Muhammadanism, he testifies regarding the Quran and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He says, illiterate himself, scarcely able to read or write. He was yet the author of a book, of a book, which is a poem, a code of laws, a book of common prayers, and a Bible all in one, all in one. And is reverenced to this day by a sixth of the whole human race as a miracle. 
as a miracle of purity, of style, of wisdom and of truth. It is the one miracle claimed by Muhammad. His standing miracle, he called it, and a miracle indeed it is. This is the book of God. Allah testifies to it, and we have been proving it yesterday. At the beginning of my talk yesterday, I mentioned that I was not going to go into details about what is the Torah, what is the Zabur, what is the Injil. We Muslims, we believe in these heavenly books that God Almighty did reveal His messages to mankind. We name them Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Furqan. Furqan is the Quran. I said, you have to get this book. I wonder if you got them yesterday. You received them yesterday? If you haven't, they might be available today. If not, at the Islamic Propagation Center in Coventry Road here in Birmingham, you will get it absolutely free of charge. But I might refresh your memory regarding what is written there. We explain that the Torah is not the Old Testament. The Injil is not the New Testament. Look, the Christians, they don't call the Bible Old Testament, New Testament as Torah and Injil. They don't. Why should you? They, what they say is, this is Kitab, Kitabul Kadim, Kitabul Jadid. That means the old book and the new book. That is what they call the old and the new. Why must you say Torah? Why must you say Injil? Why must you say Zabur? Then what is this Torah, Zabur and Injil? It is the revelation, the Wahi. God Almighty gave Hazrat Musa salam, we say that is the Torah. Whatever Allah gave to Hazrat Dawud salam, David, the Prophet David, that is the Zabur, whatever he gave. Whatever he gave to Hazrat Isa salam, is the Injil. Where is it? Where are these books? Ask the Christians, ask the Jews, where is, are these books that God gave to Moses? Where are these books that God gave to Isa salam, Jesus? Where? Ask them. You don't go and put your neck under the guillotine and says, now look, you accept, you accept, what do you accept? It's the principle we accept that Allah did reveal his messages. But when you look at the books, what the Christians themselves say about their own books, in the Bible, printed by Collins, they have a list of the books of the Bible. And the authors of those books, the books of the Bible and their authors. I will only read out what the Christian scholars say. That Collins translation, this one here, was brought about this RSV, Revised Standard Version, by 32 Christian scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations of Christendom. They went and produced this book. And in this book, on page 12 to 17, it says, the first book of the Bible called Genesis, supposed to be the book of Moses, supposed to be the Torah. This is what the Christian scholars say. Genesis, author, full stop. Then it says, one of the five books of Moses, and the words, five books of Moses is written in inverted commas. You know what it means, inverted commas? You know those commas you put up to say you are quoting somebody. This is not what you say. When you quote somebody, you put the words in inverted commas. Meaning, this is what people say. We don't say that. We, 32 learned men of Christendom, with 50 p denominations, churches, different church groups backing us up, we are not putting, we are not committing ourselves to say that this is the book of Moses. This is one of the books of Moses who say, people say. You check it up, it's in inverted commas. The second book, Exodus, author. Generally, generally credited to Moses, generally. That's what people say again, generally. Everybody says that Moses, generally, this is what people talk, say. Leviticus, the third book, author, generally credited to Moses. Numbers, author, generally credited to Moses. Deuteronomy, there's the fifth book, author, generally credited to Moses. 
This is what they say. Why should you go beyond that? I want to know. Next book, Joshua. Author, major part credited to Joshua. It's supposed to be the book of Joshua, but major part credited to him. That means the whole of the book is not his. Judges, book of Judges. Possibly Samuel. Possibly Samuel. A fellow by the name of Samuel. He's possibly he wrote it. Ruth, author, not definitely known. Perhaps Samuel. Perhaps Samuel. Ruth, first Samuel, another book called First Samuel. Author unknown. Second Samuel, author unknown. First Kings, author unknown. Second Kings, author unknown. First Chronicles, author unknown. Second Chronicles, author likely collected and edited by Ezra. Likely. Ezra, author probably written or edited by Ezra. Esther, author unknown. Job, author unknown. And on and on. This is what they are telling you. An anonymous book. Not even the author who wrote them, leave out God on one side, leave God one side. The, the human authors, the writers are not even known who wrote them. But you attribute them to so and so, so and so, so and so. This is what they say. Stick by that. Don't go beyond that. Let's come to the New Testament, the Injil. They say the Injil is the New Testament. And Dr. Sharosh did me a great favor. He gave me this Bible here. Quite an expensive Bible. This is, as I said yesterday, a red letter Bible. Red letter. Everything that Jesus spoke is in red. That is what they tell us. Whether you accept or not, that besides the point. But everything in red is Jesus. Everything in black, nothing to do with Jesus. Jesus didn't utter those words. Leave out God, not even Jesus. And out of the 27 books of the New Testament, in this particular volume, 21, 21 out of 27, you work out the percentage, 21 out of 27 books has not got even a red dot, or a dash, or a doodle, you know, anybody scribbling. Nothing in red, not even a red scratch. Out of 27 books, 21, no marking at all. And in the latest, what they call the Living Bible, also Red Letter Bible, 23 out of 27, not even a red dot, dot, dash, or a doodle. Look, they're telling you this is not, not even a, a quotation of Jesus. Not a single word of his is quoted in the 23 books out of 27. Not a word is quoted. And you say, these are the books of Jesus. Look, this is what they're telling you, that this is not the work of Jesus. Leave out God one side. Even Jesus didn't write the New Testament. And the bulk of it, not one word of him is even quoted inside. The authors within the book, what do they say? We take Luke. He is supposed to be the most learned of the evangelists. Most learned. He was a physician. In his Gospel of St. Luke, he says, chapter 1, verse 1, beginning, he says, In as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which are most surely believed among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also. Seeing that others have done the job, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. is writing to a patron of his, a Greek convert, and he's dedicating this book to him, not God, him, he's doing it. And because others have done, he says, look, I think I can do a better job. The others were less educated than myself. So I can give you an orderly account. The others were writing hodgepodge here, there, everything mixed up. I'm going to give you an orderly account of Jesus Christ and the things that we have been learning. And in doing that, we find that he has been copying from somewhere. What is called plagiarism. You see, our, my opponent yesterday 
And previously he was boasting that three quarter of that wonderful Quran, 75% of that wonderful Quran in my wonderful language of Arabic is from the Bible. I challenge him again and again, produce one verse from the Bible in the Quran, one verse and he failed. Again and again he failed. He was insinuating that our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he copied from the Bible. So I said, here's the Arabic Bible, here's the Arabic Quran, show me one verse. There isn't. But let us see, the charges that they're living against us is befitting them. I'm reading to you now, Matthew, I'm sorry, Luke, chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. Luke 3, 7 to 9. Just some of these verses I give you. We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. You read Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 to 10. Look, amazing. Luke chapter 3, 7 to 9. Matthew chapter 3, 7 to 10. As if they are both sitting with somebody else's copy. And word for word, word for word. It says, we have Abraham as our father. For I saw to you, I, I say to you, that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones, word for word. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. I'm, I'm quoting from both books. So, then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of wipers, brood of wipers, you snakes, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? This is the same thing. Brood of wipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Word for word. Between these two quotations, in the Greek language, out of 63 words, 60 are word for word. In other words, in copying, the fellow might have left out a proposition or an adjective somewhere. Out of 63 words between these two, 60 are 100% copying, word for word. And the Christians, they do not believe in a verbal inspiration. Meaning that God Almighty dictated. They were given the free choice. They were tickled. Somehow, mm, come on, write me something. Just write like this. Mm, mm. You know, we have our prejudices. So write this and write that. They were tickled. They were not dictated to. Like the Quran, we believe, was dictated. Word for word. Allah bari ta'ala, the first wahi, he gives our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, iqra, read. Our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, ma'ana biqarin, he said, I'm not learned. So the angel of God commands him a second time, iqra, read. Again, our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he pleads, ma'ana biqarin, he said, I'm not learned. How can I read? The third time, the angel of God embraces him hard and says, iqra, bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of thy Lord and cherisher who created. So our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he grasps that what he was required to do was to repeat. Because this Arabic word iqra means to read, to recite, to rehearse, to repeat. So he repeated the words as they were given to him. The first five verses of Surah Al-Alaq, chapter 96. And subsequently, during the next 23 years of his prophetic life, whatever was given, word for word, a verbal inspiration, the Holy Prophet had it dictated and had it written down. It's a verbal inspiration. The Christians do not believe in a verbal inspiration. They believe that all these writers were tickled and their own personalities, they came in to the writing of it. So plagiarism, copying, cribbing, we are asking them, where are these Matthew and Luke, where are they cribbing from? Who are they copying? J.B. Phillips, he gives the answer. A prebendary of the Chichester Cathedral in England. A paid servant of the Anglican Church, the Church of England. In his book, The Gospels in Modern English, commenting on the Gospel of St. Matthew, he says, early tradition ascribed this Gospel to the Apostle Matthew. Early tradition. People were talking that, look, this is Matthew, this is Matthew did the job, Matthew did the job. But scholars nowadays almost all reject this view. 
what scholars hindu scholars muslim scholars jewish scholars no christian scholars almost all reject the view that matthew wrote matthew he says the author whom we may still conveniently call matthew what else can we do and we have to talk about the book so conveniently we use the word matthew conveniently instead of saying the first book of the new, new testament chapter 5 verse 5 the first book of the new testament chapter 5 was what is this first book of the new testament first book of the new testament it's the same matthew 5 5 matthew 5 17 conveniently we have to use the word matthew the author whom we may still conveniently call matthew has plainly drawn drawn on the mysterious q in inverted commas which means quella in german which means sources mysterious sources which might have been a collection of oral traditions he has drawn this man matthew has drawn on mark's gospel freely in the language of the school teacher he has been copying wholesale from mark wholesale and you call it revelation you call it wahi you call it injil this man is copying wholesale from mark and mark was a 10 year old boy when jesus walked this earth can you imagine an eyewitness a ear witness a companion of jesus he goes and copies a 10 year old boy who wasn't there who's telling you all this the christian learned man the scholar is telling you what reason have we to doubt that what is their motive except honesty they are honest but it doesn't suit the evangelist the preacher the bible thumper it doesn't suit him he says no 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 this is given by god analyze it the bible we have been dealing with numerous things according the format was according to his urging he wanted us to speak for 75 minutes each i said look 60 should be the limit is it not 75 i said okay 75 if that's what you want and who was to speak first a coin was tossed you see the mic system was not working at the back when Shorosh came from the other side and I met, we met in the middle with the chairman and a coin was tossed. You couldn't hear what was going on because of the mic. There was no mic, audible mic there. So he said he wants head and he got head. He won. So he said now Mr. Didak, because he won, he has a right to dictate. So he said Mr. Didak, you speak first. This is quite in order. So I spoke first, because he had won the toss. I spoke for 75 minutes, giving facts, facts and figures, facts and figures, quotations, quotations. That this is not the book of God, this is not the book of God, this is not the book of God. When his 75 minutes came, he never touched it. Nothing! Look, here was an opportunity. One by one he could have picked them up. If not, at least half a dozen, at least quarter dozen. He wouldn't touch it. He had his own stories made up and he read out beautifully. He read it out to you all, you know, 700 miles an hour or 60 miles an hour. Shh! He's got me stumped. Now, there's something what he was quoting scholars, scholars, scholars. One of them, he quoted some Muslim scholar. I wonder if you remember the name. Masudi, Masudi. Wallah, I never heard the name in my life. Masudi. That he wrote in his book that Hazrat Ali, he killed 500 persons with his hands. We are talking about the Quran. We are not talking about Masudi or Ghazali or whosoever or Ahmad Bida. We are talking about the Quran. Does the Quran say that Hazrat Ali killed 500 people with his hands? No, we are talking about the Quran. He said, Masudi said such and such. So what, what are you going to do with it? You're going to start battling with Masudi? How many of you know about Masudi? How many has read about Masudi? I haven't. Well, I haven't. But now, if you are talking about authors, authors that you can know, you know current authors, people are living, I mean, current time. George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw, a playwright in England. He died. He says, 
that the most dangerous book on earth, the Bible, he says, the most dangerous book on earth. He said, keep it under lock and key. Your children must not have access to it. Well, Sir Bernard Shaw is a critic. He's, he's not a good Christian. He's not a born again. Well, listen to the born again. The Plain Truth magazine. The authors are the Armstrong family. Herbert Armstrong, Trevor Armstrong, Ted Garner Armstrong. The owners of Plain Truth magazine, seven to eight million a month, they publish free of charge to the world. Seven to eight million, there's not another society in the world who can give out seven to eight million copies of a beautiful four color magazine. In their magazine, The Plain Truth, October 1977, they say, reading Bible stories to children can also open up all sorts of opportunities. I don't know what opportunities he means. All sorts of opportunities. You read to them Bible stories, it opens up all sorts of opportunities for you to discuss the morality of sex with the children. Incest, rape, murder, adulteries, fornications, all sorts of opportunities to discuss the morality of sex to little children. An unexpurgated Bible might get an X rating from some senses. Cross. Not worth having it in the house. This is an unexpurgated version of the Bible will get an X rating. These are the Christian people telling you, the church people, that will get an X rating. Cross is not worth children having it. Comparing the Quran and the Bible, Hans Kuhn, he is a German scholar, in his book called Infallible, question mark. He is asking the question whether the Bible is infallible. He says, who is this man? This is the 43-year-old Swiss-born professor of dogmatic and ecumenical theology and director of the Institute of Ecumenical Studies at Tübingen University in West Germany, was one of the select group of official theologians appointed during Vatican II Council by Pope John himself. Pope John himself appointed this man, known as the young protege of modern theology, Hans Kuhn, he says. Thus the Bible, thus the Bible is not a miraculous book like the Quran. He admits the Bible is not a miraculous book like the Quran. A sacred, error-free book. This is not a Muslim talking. He is a theologian of the highest order. It's a, a sacred, error-free book containing innumerable, infallible propositions directly revealed by heaven to the prophet through angels that therefore has to be accepted literally and consequently may not be interpreted or commented on. Before touching the Bible, one does not have to wash one's hands. You can handle it as you like. One's hand. Nowhere do the books of the New Testament claim to have fallen directly from heaven. Nowhere does the books of the New Testament claim to have fallen directly from heaven. On the contrary, often enough, they quite candidly emphasize the human origin. And he quotes Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. What I read to you just now. They show the human origin. Some of the things which he threw yesterday, Shorosh, among them was, I can't remember them all. He said, question time, if you remember anything, that you think is of importance that I have missed, please don't hesitate at question time to ask. Yes, look, Mr. D. Dad, what about this or what about that? Because shh, so many things he had been doing wholesale, you know, red herrings, red herrings, it's very, very difficult for the human mind to grasp all that. But if you remember any aspect, anything, any point that you feel that it should be ex explained, I'm at your disposal. One of the things he said was, that in the Quran, the name for Jesus in Arabic is Isa. And he feels that this is incongruous. Isa. He said the name of Jesus was Esau. Agreed. 
classical Yeshua. Yeshua, classical Hebrew, common Hebrew Esau. Like you have the man James, you call him Jimmy or Jim. So they call Esau instead of Yeshua. Yeshua is a classical name for Jesus. Most probably his mother named him Yeshua. Commonly Esau. Hebrew, Esau. In Arabic, Isa. Very close. You see, these are sister languages. Hebrew and Arabic are sister languages. These are dialects. One says Yom, Yom, Yom. Yomul Juma, Yomul Sat. Yom, Yom. Ahad, Ikhad. Same. Salam, Shalom. Same. They are identical languages, sounding similar. Esau, Isa. He said, it's Esau, not Isa. I am asking, where do you get Jesus from? Esau, if that is his name, and you are taking exception to Isa, a pronunciation in Arabic of that Hebrew name Esau, Isa, where do you get Jesus from now? You tell me now, where does Jesus come from? There's no J in the name. It's a type of sickness that the Westerner has developed. Where there is no J, he puts a J. Wherever. Yehovah, Yahuwah, God Almighty, he puts a J, Jehovah. Yaakub is a Jacob. Yusuf is a Joseph. J, J, J. Esau, Jesus, this is Jesus. I said, look, where did you get these J's from? In my country, if you do J walking, you know, Jay walking, when you cross against a robo, when the robo is against you, and if you walk across, or places where you're not supposed to cross the street, in my country, they give you a ticket for Jay walking. It means you just walk like that, don't care type. That's called Jay walking. The Christians have walked with Jay walking into people's names. Where there's no Jay, 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 Jay. I said, where did you get the Jays from? Look. It's an amazing, amazing situation that Isa and Esau, in the different languages of the world, they have the Bible, he said, in how many languages? Hundreds of languages. Every language group has its own particular way of pronouncing the name. The Africans in South Africa, they say, Jesus. Not Jesus, they say, Jesus. You take exception to that? Look, that is their way. See? But now, he's... You see, the thing is getting, they can swallow the camel, but they're struggling at the end, the net. The challenge. The challenge, Allah says, tell them, Kul hatu burhanakum. Produce your proof, your evidence. And at one stage, when I was mentioning, I said, look, this is what you said. And he said, he was ready there and then, at the very moment, to come forward and give us the proof and I was a little <laughs> taken aback don't blame me the man was so enthusiastic he seemed that Jesus got it man and when he came on I'm listening listening I said now any minute any minute he's gonna give the blow 75 minutes went and there was no blow I'm wondering what happened so during question time <laughs> During uh, the rebuttals, he came forth, he brought a book. But he didn't make it clear to the people what that book was all about. I couldn't sense it then. It took me some time. He brought this book, this green book here. I wonder if you saw this. He was brandishing this book. And he was trying to give us a sample of something like the Quran. He read out in Arabic. And most of us, non-Arabs, we start wondering, man, so what is, is this the Quran? We are not all Hafiz al Quran. We don't know the Quran by heart, by memory. So we are guessing it sounds like, you know, it sounds like Arabic, it sounds like some Quranic words. He was reading from this book. They have produced this new book, a new gospel in Arabic. This book is a book in Arabic of messages from the Bible and they call it 
contextualization contextualization it's a new word for me in other words they want to present the bible to you in a language which you are used to so they start this is the bible the new testament messages from the bible you open the book first chapter it begins it begins here first chapter they're trying to produce now something like the Quran to challenge you that look we can also do the same first verse every chapter first verse Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim every chapter Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is this what you have produced you copycats huh? Can you see the deception? Every chapter begins Bismillah. That's the Quran. Every chapter of the Quran begins Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Bismillah. So they follow. Example. So the common man, the ordinary person, when he picks it up, he thinks it's a Muslim publication. This is Allah's kalam, Allah's kalam, and the language. This is the photo step from there. The language. Uh, the title. The title of this surahs, the chapters exactly like the Quran you see we have the Quran the surahs in the Quran we say Makki Makki surahs and Madani surahs surahs that were revealed in Makkah are Makki and those that were revealed in Madina are Madani so they give you the same now they tell you these are Magdisi Magdisi you know Baitul Muqaddas means it was revealed in Jerusalem or around so when you say Magdisi, you know Makki, you know Madani, now you use Magdisi. So it's the same, same type of language they use. Then it begins. Zikru, Zikru, Ta'budi, Zakaria. You read in the Quran. Zikru, Abdahu, Zakaria. So, Zakaria, Al-Muttaqeen, Wa Makana, Shaykhun Kabir, Wa Inkana, Liyadkhul Al-Mihrabi. Words from the Quran they have been stealing, 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 putting inside the book, and now they produce this to say, so you see, we have produced something to compete with the Quran. After 1,400 years, the Arab Christian has done it. I think we should we should give them an applause. <laughs> After 1,400 years, it's 14 million Arab Christians. They did it. They have done the job, and they're presenting it to the Muslims now. Here is what we have produced. Cheating, 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 deceiving, deceiving, deceiving. That's all. And to deceive the people, you remember the brother said, Shorosh, he said, that 5,000 Bibles have been shipped from America for you, for you Muslims, to be given to you free. Very generous. The Christians are very generous. But he says it was wrongly addressed. This is God's way. Allah did it. Can you imagine 5,000 coming? <laughs> but sooner or later, they'll rectify the situation. We are now getting this in our own country, in my country. Every Muslim is receiving this absolutely free of charge. No greater love. The title of the book is No Greater Love. Which young man don't want to read this? I want to know who doesn't want to read it. Look, when I was young, I was really reading true romance, eleven romance. Ooh, I used to lap them up. There's a stage, a stage in every man's life. There was a time I started with comic cats, comics, 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 and then I, I advanced to love and romance, and from there on I went to, I went to true detectives, detective mysteries, and then from there to mystic science and then on to religion. This is how your tastes cultivate from childhood. You know, from comics to no greater love. What do you think it is all about? Can you guess? No greater love. You think it's Lady Chatterley's lover? Hmm? It's got nothing to do with Lady Chatterley's lover. The book that was banned in my country for 20 years because of one four letter word inside there. You know what is this? This is the Injil. This is the New Testament. Look at this. Look at it, multicolor. Look at the beautiful rose. 
catching fish. So any young man is going to take this up and say, now let's see, now what's this all about? This young heroine, you know, and, uh, and the romance. Most probably, they will go to the directory, and all of you who are in the directory, you might be getting this by post free of charge. So far, it tells us here, 2,750,000 have been given out free. You might be the lucky ones to get those 5,000 in Birmingham. Now, to give you some fresh examples of what I was talking about yesterday. You see, Dr. Shirosh, in the debate, he mentioned one of the stup st most stupendous feet of Hazrat Isa Alayhi Salam, Jesus. And he quoted from John, Gospel of St. John, chapter 3, verse 13. He quoted, he says, No man has ascended into heaven. No man has ascended into heaven except the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus. Except the Son of Man who descended from heaven, who is in heaven. That's John chapter 3 verse 13. He quoted that. No man has gone up except Jesus. But the man hadn't gone up when this thing was written. It, it hasn't happened. The, the ascension had not happened. And the man is talking that no man has ascended into heaven except the Son of Man, Jesus, who descended from heaven. Did he descend from heaven? Luke tells us that when he was eight days old, Luke tells us, when he was eight days old, he was circumcised and named Jesus by the angel when he was in his mother's womb. So where did he come out from? from his mother's womb. He said he descended from heaven. Who saw him coming down? The nurses and whoever were helping Mary in the stable, they saw this Jesus, this puny little child with all the filth and the muck which made his mother impure for 40 days according to Jewish law, coming out of his mother's womb. Now they said, no, he descended from heaven. Who is in heaven? And who is in heaven? But the man was on earth and he's having a rough time with the Jews. He's in hell. The Jews are giving hells to him and he, said, and he is in heaven. So in the next, you remember the five major revisions? In the sixth major revision, the words who is in heaven is now eliminated. In the revised standard version, who is in heaven is taken out. Because they know it's not fitting. The man is here on earth and says, who is in heaven? What heaven? This hell that you are in. Is that your heaven? The book gives you devilish advice. The Bible, if it's the word of God, listen to what it says. It says, give strong drink, hard liquor, strong drink, hard liquor, to him who is perishing. Anybody who is about to die, any nation is about to perish, what you do? Give them strong drink, give them hard liquor. Open your book, open the Bible, and if you have it, check it out. The book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verses 6 and 7. Proverbs, chapter 31, verses 6 and 7. Open your Bibles and see the advice given, this devilish advice given by God. That if a people are dying, like the Abor aboriginals of Australia, the white man has been giving him drink. The Red Indians, you go to America, you go to Canada, see what is the, the fate of these people. Drink, drink, drink. In Africa, drink, alcohol, alcohol, alcohol. The first freedom that my country gave to the black people was what they call the bottle franchise. You can buy bottle now. Bottle franchise was the first franchise that we ever received in South Africa was the bottle. Give him drink. You want to make a nation to perish? You want to destroy a people? Give him strong drink, says the Holy Bible. Let him drink and forget his poverty. Yes, forget his sorrow and remember his misery no more. That's the advice. God gives you that advice. And I have been seeing, you know, as a boy, I used to go and see a lot of these cowboy films. And when the guy is dying, I see that they give him a tot. They give him a drink. And then, then the guy goes off peacefully. The man is dying, they give him drink. The man is dying, they give him drink. I say, where did you get this idea from? A man who's dying, if the Muslims, they give them honey in water. You know that? Easy digestible, give you quick energy. The man is on the, on the throes of death. 
You give him hard drink, strong drink, hard liquor. No, that's what the Bible says. Give him hard drink. So they give hard drink. A man is dying, give him hard drink. A nation is perishing, give him hard drink, hard liquor. I don't know how Shurush forgot. You see, in the previous debate, he was quoting from the book of Peter, 2 Peter verses 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21. And Jimmy Swaggart also, amazing, they are all the evangelists are quoting the same verses. In America, Jimmy Swaggart, if you see the tape, he's quoting that verse. And you see the tape of the Shorosh is quoting the same verse. The verse, I don't know if he forgot yesterday because it's too many written things to read out. It says here, For the prophecy came not, prophecy, telling you things that is going to happen in the future, came not by the will of man, by the impulse of man, by the whims and fancies of man, no. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. As the Holy Ghost moved them, tickled them, they wrote what they were told to write. And so the whole Bible is from God. Because the Holy Ghost tickled these writers to write what they wrote. But the Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy, you will be given at question time enough time to ask questions. In the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of Moses, chapter 18, verses 21 to 22, it says, it puts a test. It says, and if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? How are we to know whether God did speak those things or not which the people wrote? Verse 22, it says, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, in the name of God, if the thing follow not, if it doesn't happen, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. If a prophet of God tells you such and such a thing that God said, and if the thing doesn't happen, we know that it is not the word of God. That is the thing the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. That's a test. The Quran says, Wa'adallahu haqq. The promise of God is true. Whatever Allah says must come to pass. Beautiful test. Now, if we examine, if we examine verses from the Bible, prophecies, they are boasting about prophecies. 300 prophecies were fulfilled in one day. The day Christ died, 300 they say were fulfilled in one day. Let us look at these prophecies. One or two. I am quoting from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. When the good news is given to Mary about the birth of a holy son, and the good news is, he will be great. You know your son? He will be great. And will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. His father David, his ancestor David, Dawud salam, was ruling in Jerusalem sitting on an earthly throne. He was a ruler, a king. So the Lord God will give him, Jesus, your son, Mary, telling Mary, your son, the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, the Israelis. Jacob, Yaqub, he later on became known as Israel. And his children, the 12 sons, became the sons of Jacob became children of Israel and their families became the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. And he will re reign, rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Telling Mary, look, don't worry. There will be problems, but don't worry. Your son will be great and he will be the son of God. He will be the son of the highest. And he is going to sit on the throne of his father David. And he will rule over the house of Jacob, over the Israelis forever. That's the prophecy. Poor lady, she took on the burden of carrying this baby for nine months and she delivered it and bore endless insults from the Jews for this child. Jesus. Now, the fulfillment. Instead of Jesus sitting on the throne of his father David, a pagan, a mushrik was sitting on that throne, Pontius Pilate. And he was sitting in judgment on Jesus. And he's asking Jesus, Are thou the king of the Jews? You! Are you the king of the Jews? 
So Jesus says, thou sayest, that's what you say. He says, am I a Jew to tell you that? Your people say that you are claiming to be a king. So Jesus says, John chapter 18, verse 36. Verse 36, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. What kingdom? What kingdom? It's a heavenly kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. He is a prophet of God. He is a ruler over the hearts and minds of men. Yes, but not sitting on the throne of his father David. His father David was sitting on an earthly throne, giving judgment against people, slaughtering people according to his will. He was a king and a ruler. Jesus Christ is a victim of that chair. And ruling over the house of Jacob, over the Israelis, who is ruling in Jerusalem now? Who is real ruling in Palestine? Jesus or the Jews? No, look, you don't need any super intelligence to answer that. Who is ruling in Israel? Jesus or the Jews? Who is ruling? Jews. Jews. And you say, this is the fulfillment of prophecy. God Almighty, he gives false promises. You see this Palestine, this belongs to the Jews. The man gave away the whole of Palestine. It's 180,000 square miles from the Nile to the Euphrates. And southern Lebanon also, it's in the bargain, thrown in. You know why? That Shamgar and Samson, don't forget them. They are responsible for that mentality. You are prepared to give away everything. God promises Abraham. They say, you see, the Jews have a title deed to Palestine. Where is your title deed? So this is in the Bible. God gave it to him. So what did he give? So look, he says here, book of Genesis chapter 17 verse 8. I'm reading. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be the God. That's what God promised to Abraham. I will give unto you and to your seed after you all the land of Canaan, the whole of Palestine as an everlasting possession and I will be the God. If this is Allah's promise, then the promise must come true. Let us see what the Bible says. The same Bible in which you read this, let us see what it says in the book of Hebrews. Chapter 11 verses 9 to 13 it says, 13 it says, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, by faith, believing that he is going to get what God had promised him, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, dwelling in tents. Then in the book of Acts, Acts chapter five, 7 verse 5 it says, and God gave him no inheritance in it. The same Bible now, the same God is telling him, look I give you everything, you and your children forever. Now the same God tells them, he is dictating to Luke in the book of Acts, and God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot upon, not even one square foot of land. Is this the promise of God? God promised him the whole of Palestine and the poor man, he died without getting one square foot of land. Is this from God? Amazing, amazing. Prophecies are being falsified. Jesus Christ had made certain prophecies. He says, he's telling his disciples, but when they persecute you, when they oppress you, in this city, flee to another. When they persecute you here, run away from here. Run away from Birmingham to Leicester. From Leicester, if they persecute you, go away to London. Keep, run, run. For assuredly, I say to you, most assuredly, most surely I'm telling you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes, before he returns. Son of Man, Jesus. Ask any Christian who is the Son of Man, say Jesus. Jesus is telling them, look, when they persecute you, don't worry man, you run from one city to another, and to another, and, but before you go over the cities of Israel, I will be back. Two thousand years have gone, and they ran and they ran, the early Christians, and they died and they were persecuted and they were hanged and crucified, and they were looking up to the heavens for Jesus, 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 and even today, they're still waiting for Jesus, he hasn't come back yet. They have gone and perished. Fulfillment of prophecy. And when will he come back? It says here in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Mark chapter 13 verses 26. 
and 27 and 30. Assuredly, most surely I'm telling you, I say to you, this generation, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. All these things, Jesus Christ is going to come with, with thunder and lightning and glory. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. He will collect them all. When this generation is telling them, this generation shall not pass before all these things shall be. And 2,000 years have gone and nothing has happened yet. I say forget, forget, forget this word of God or not. On that human level we were talking, sane, sober people, I want your judgment. Does God Almighty command his emissary, his prophets, to do shameful things? Will he? And he has it recorded in his book. This is the prince of the prophets, prince of the prophets, according to Shorosh. Isaiah, he calls him prince of the prophets. His book, the book of Isaiah, he calls it the fifth gospel. If there are four gospels in the New Testament, this you can be added and make it the fifth gospel, according to Shorosh. This prince of the prophets, this is what God does to him. At the same time, speak the Lord to Isaiah. God spoke to Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, go and lose the sackcloth from thy loins. You know the sackcloth that you're tying? Untie that. And put the, off thy shoes from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. A prophet of God, for three years, he's walking up and down the streets of Jerusalem or wherever he was, absolutely naked, not even a G-string. Can you imagine God giving such instructions to his prophet, his emissary? Go walk, and three years in front of his mother, in front of his daughters, sisters, everybody, he's walking a prophet of God, one of the mightiest of the prophets of the Bible, he's walking naked for three years. And the Lord said, like as my servant Isaiah had walked naked and barefoot three years, so you also, we're going to make you to do the same. Allah bari ta'ala tells in the Quran, he says that he does not. He says, Qul, tell them, Inna Allah la ya'muru bil fasha. Allah does not command any shameful deed. You say about Allah what you don't know? In ignorance, God Almighty telling His prophets to go walk about naked <laughs> and speaking language like this, God talking, so behold I will corrupt your seed. This is the book of Malachi chapter 2 verse 3. Behold I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces. You know what's dung? You know what's dung? Use excreta. Yes, God Almighty is going to spread dung on your faces. Even the dung of your solemn feasts. And one shall take you away with it. Malachi 2, 3. And thou shalt eat it, telling another prophet of his. Another prophet of God, Ezekiel. God tells him, chapter 4, verse 12 of Ezekiel, he says, And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes. What? And thou shalt bake it with dung that come out of man in their sight. What you see, fresh dung. Fresh excreta with barley cakes, you shall eat it. This is, the, this is God Almighty telling his prophet to, to eat barley cakes with, and fresh dung too, fresh. It must be fresh, not that stale dried up thing you know, that you can burn like goat, goat, this thing. God Almighty. He is not like Shylock. You know Shylock, Shakespeare made him famous, Shylock. He wanted that Christian pound of flesh. He entered into a contract, an agreement with this Christian. He lent him some money. He said, look, by a certain date, if you don't pay, I'll, I'll take one pound of flesh. Shakespeare made Shylock famous. He made the Jews famous. Shakespeare, William Shakespeare. When the contract was broken, he is demanding for one pound of flesh. That's all. He said, I want one according to contract. But God Almighty, He is not satisfied with one for one. Mm -hmm. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 5, He says, For I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. You make a sin, I am going to visit their sins and punish them to third and fourth generation out of those who hate me. And 
He's going to punish you seven times over for whatever you do. And after all, Leviticus chapter 26, verses 18, 23, 24, 28. And after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. If you, you didn't do your homework, my son, so you're supposed to get one cut, one lash. But no, no, no. This headmaster of yours will give you seven cuts. Everybody's supposed to get one cut for not doing homework, you will get seven cuts. And if by these things you are not reformed by me, but walk contrary to me, then also will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins, seven times. Then I also again, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury, and I even I will chastise you seven times for your sins. Allah tells us in the Quran, this is what he says, Inna Allah la yazlimu misqala zarra. Allah will not do the least bit of injustice to you. He says, Jaa bil hasanati falahu khayrum minha. If you do a good deed, he will reward you better than your deed. You do one good deed, Allah says, he'll reward you better than your deed. He can reward you a million fold for every deed of yours, good deed of yours. Woman jaa bi sayyati, but if you do anything evil, fala yuzzal lazina amil sayyat illa maakanu, maakanu ya'madun. And the doers of evil are only punished to the extent of their deeds. Whatever you deserve, you get. You do good, Allah can reward you a million fold. You do evil, to the extent of what you have done, you will be punished. The God of the Bible says, seven times over. And I'm going to visit the sins of the fathers into the third and fourth generation, taking revenge. God Almighty, He deceives, says the Bible. He deceives. He says He deceives. Or the prophet is crying out. Jeremiah the prophet, he says. Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 20, verse 7, he says. Oh Lord, oh Lord, you deceived me and I was deceived. God, you deceived me and I was deceived. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. What can I do? I'm helpless. If you want to deceive me, how can I resist deception? You are stronger than I and have prevailed. I'm in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. Oh Lord, you deceive me. You are a deceiver. God is a deceiver. Allah tells you in the Quran that He guides, He does not misguide. And on and on. There's so much. There's so much. Wallah, there's so much. I can keep you here further for hours, but that is not my purpose. I think we should now give opportunity to my brothers and sisters, Muslim and non Muslim, preferably our non Muslim brothers first. If there are any who would like to ask questions, I think they should be given the first opportunity to ask questions. And after, give them the first opportunity. We don't want them to say later on, he said, look man, uh, the time expired and you know, they didn't give us a break. So people, I think if they will queue up, they will have an idea of what amount of time to give to the questioner. The mic is there. I think the mic is too close to the stage. You know, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, the mic is too close to the stage. So in other words, if you are sitting down, we can't see the the questioner. If it can be pulled further front, it will be very nice. See if it can be pulled further front. That's better. That's better. Yes. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your patient hearing. Jazakallah. Ladies and gentlemen, please be advised that you are invited to direct questions to the speaker which are relevant to his address. Statements will not be welcome. It's questions that are required which are relevant to the address. All those desirous of directing questions to the speaker must please proceed to the mic. Preference will be given to those who actually come first. But as Mr. Didat has indicated, we should allow the non-Muslims to actually direct their questions to the speaker. Any more, let them come forward first before we get started. Okay. Yes, I recommend that those who are desirous of asking questions come along and join the queue at this stage, in order to ensure that there's a proper order. You have a question, sir.
Yes, I'd like to ask Mr. Didat why he didn't reply to my letter that I wrote to him on the 15th of May 1987, which I know arrived in his offices in South Africa, and he didn't have the courtesy to reply to this letter. Could he please tell me why? Was it because he couldn't reply to it? Sir, so that question is not relevant to his discussion. I appreciate that it might be. Well, it does have to do, if I might just say, it does. Because in this letter, I raise the question as to whether the modern Quran is a true representation of the original work of Muhammad. Because I sent to Mr. Didat. Is that your question, sir? It was the question raised in this letter. Are you raising that question? I am raising that question. Mr. Didat will now attempt to answer the question. Mr. Didat. What was the question? Chairman, Mr. Chairman, what was the question? I, I Whether didn't... the modern day Quran is a true representation of the original work of Muhammad. What was that? I didn't hear. The question, as I understand it, is Is the Quran, the gentleman said, modern day Quran, a true representation of the teachings of Muhammad? Is that what you said, sir? Yes. Has it been added to as the the book that I mentioned in this letter claims that the Quran has been added to over the centuries. Now, Mr. Didat levels a challenge to the Christian about the Bible being added to, but in fact, this book claims that the Quran has also been added to over the centuries. In other words, Would you like to reply to that? In other words, is the Quran original or have there been any changes made correct. to the Quran? That's correct. 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 This Quran is the same Quran that Muhammad left. Word for word, and for 1400 years, this is the only religious book on the face of the earth which has remained pure without the change of a dot. And these are the testimony of Sir William Moyer, that the only book remaining so pure for 1400 years, he said 1200 years of old, but for 1400 years is this book. This is the book that Muhammad left. There is no change in this book. Why didn't you tell me that? I wrote to you in May 1987 and asked you that. Thank you. I Next know you question. only allow one question normally, but there was a more important one, and that was that you were challenging the writings of the Old Testament, commonly known as the Old Testament. Now, really speaking, are you challenging the Jews or the Christians because these are Hebrew writings and it's not right and fair to direct such criticism to the Christian world? This book here, the Old Testament, the Christians say is the book of the Jews, the Bible of the Jews, the Old Testament. The Old and the New put together is the Bible of the Christians. So the Jews are being challenged as well as the Christians in what I said yesterday and what I said today, because most of the quotations were from the old and the new. So if the old applies to the Jew, the Jew is challenged as well as the Christian, because the Christian owns the whole, whole lot, old well, and the new. We'll leave that for the Jew to answer then, shall we? Thank you, the next, sir. If they keep a little away from the mouthpiece, if they keep a little away, uh, you know, because it's too close that side. I would like to know. Would you come a little closer, please? Thank you. I would like to know your views on Muslims marrying Christian wives, because so far it has been established that the book which has been, uh, which is with the people, or which is known to be the book is not the book as we call it a hekatab. So if a Muslim marries a Christian, which we think that those Christians are not a hekatab, so what is the position of the marriages between Muslims and Christians? Uh, I take it that you are a Muslim. Uh, I am a Muslim. Yes. You see, we had made a request, a plea, 
that please give the non-Muslim brothers and sisters an opportunity first to ask questions. But however, since you have asked, I will respond. You see, there is a possibility for a Muslim marrying a non-Muslim woman, a Jewess or a Christian. But the idea was and is that that woman will not remain where she is because this whole community, the Islamic Ummah was geared when this permission was given, it was geared in changing people. Immediately, as soon as my son, for example, brings a Christian or a Jewess in the house, a woman, I'm interested in converting her, my wife is interested in converting her, the whole family is interested in converting her, the whole environment is interested in converting her. But today, according to modern standards, my son will tell me, he says, Daddy, this is my choice, you mind your own business. Now, we know that in Islam, it is my business to mind your business, if you are a Muslim. I have every right to see that you go right. It is my business to see that you go straight. So there is no such thing... There is no such thing as my business and your business. For a Muslim, it is every Muslim's business to mind every other Muslim's business. So, today now, our brethren, because of that possibility, they are marrying women who are outside Islam with this idea that everything is alright. But in their hearts of heart, if they are Muslims, they must believe what Allah tells them in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهُ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمُ Anyone who says that Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, is God, they are making kufr. It's an act of blasphemy. It's an act of treason against Allah. وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحُ But Christ said, يَا بَنِي إِسْرَعِيلُ أُجْرُنَ فِي إِسْرَعِيلُ عَبُدُ اللَّهُ وَشِبْ اللَّهُ رَبِّي وَرَبُّكُمْ Who is my Lord and your Lord. إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهُ Whoever will associate anyone with Allah, the حَرَّمْ اللَّهُ لِيَ الْجَنَّةِ Allah will make Jannah haram for them. Heaven will be forbidden for them. وَاهُ النَّارِ And the fire of hell will be the dwelling place. وَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنصَارِ And for the wrongdoers, there will be no one to help. You believe that? If you believe, how can you stay with this woman, having one child and two and half a dozen, and you know she's going to go to hell? And your children who are going to church and worshipping Jesus are going to go to hell and you say you love them, you hypocrite, who are you bluffing? I'm not addressing you, I'm addressing the guy who's marrying these Christian women and allowing them to go to church, allowing the children to go to church and knowing if he believes in the Quran that they're going to go to hell. And you say you love this woman? He said yes. If she gets the slightest prick of a needle and you go berserk, you become sick. You love her so much? He said yes. And now the Quran says she's going to go to hell and your beloved children will go to hell and you do nothing about it? You are a hypocrite. When you say you love her, you mean sexually you are satisfied with her. That's what you mean. So this is hypocrisy on the part of the Muslims who are, and the Christian woman also. Amazing thing. Amazing thing is happening that the Christian missionaries, they are not forbidding their women to marry Muslims. I had a case when I was in Karachi that eight Pakistanis with the Christian wives from Britain, they turned up to give a hard time to a new convert from a Britisher who had become a Muslim. And they came with three Christian missionaries. Eight Pakistanis with eight Christian women with three missionaries, they came to give hard time to one of our brethren who had become a new brother in faith. So the thing is this, the Christian missionaries who turn up with them, they don't mind because they know that this is a good bait. The women is the good bait that they're using to get this Muslim and his children over into Christianity. So they're using it as a bait. We have to be on guard. I hope you understand. Will you proceed, please? Quoting from the scriptures, uh, one in particular that you quoted from, which I believe you said it was Proverbs 21, 6 and 7. But uh, you quoted about giving strong drinks uh, to and wine to men that are dying. In fact, the, the, the passage of scripture that referred to drinks as such is Proverbs 20. However, I'm a bit disappointed that you yourself did not quote verses 1 possibly through to 7 rather than just 6 and 7. I'd like to put something straight by reading it, this, that this passage to the audience. Would you permit me? Is it a mistranslation? 
Ah, the same Bible, you've got a copy of it there. I have the Bible given to me by Shorosh. Well, it's not that copy. Right? Open it and you read it, six and seven. What does it say in your Bible? Yeah, but I'm saying why did you read it? Read it, read it a little slow. Read it a little slow. Six and seven, so that I can grasp. I know what verse six, six and seven said. I said, a man of your tongue, I think, would have been permitted to allow the people to have a balance idea of what the scripture said rather than a perverted one. I can't hear. I can't understand. What is uh, shall I read this? To yes, what, what we suggest is that you read yes, those verses one through. But please do it, do so slowly and clearly. And we'll do so. Thank you. It said, chapter 20, verses 1, and I'll read right through to 7. Uh, why are you reading chapter 20 when I quoted you third? What was that? What you quoted is not written in I said, chapter 31, verses 6. What is there? It's written in chapter 20, verse But why 20? I told you 31. Because what you've said is not written there. And this is why I want that straight verse. Now, I'll read. It says, Wine is a mother, and strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The fear of the king is as the roaring lion, whoso provoke him to anger, sinneth against his own soul. It is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be met with. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the bow. Therefore shall he beg in the eyes and have nothing. Counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Most men will proclaim every one his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. The just man walketh in his integrity, his children are blessed after him. Now, you see, what I'm trying to say, Mr. Siddha Adidas, when one quotes the scriptures, need, one needs to give a balanced view. A balanced view of the scriptures. Now, I've listened to you keenly. And I've remembered. What you have read from chapter 20, very well and fitting. Yes. Beautiful. 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 You're talking to an audience of people here. Now I'm listening to you now. I'm listening to you now. I listen to you, now you listen to me. Right. What you read from chapter 20, very beautiful. We agreed because the Quran condemns alcohol in any form. But when the same author in chapter 31, verses 6 and 7, he says, give strong drink, hard liquor to him that is perishing. Those words, do they un mean anything to you at all? Do they convey any sense to you at all? Not if you read them out of context. Not if you read them out of context. It has no meaning in that sense, if you read them out of context. One must have a balanced view of whatever one does. You know, you eat food, you don't eat all the same food, do you? Do you? I, 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 can't, I, I can't follow what the brother is talking about. Are you saying, are you saying, sir, that Mr. Dida's reference to the section relating to alcohol was quoted out of context? Is that what you're saying? Sir, he gives a one-sided view of what the scripture is. Do you want him now to explain why it was contextual and not out of context? Well, is, is that it? your question? No, I'm just taking up on the point that he has spoken, right? What I want this audience to know that there's a balance view in the scriptures. And yes, but we are not interested in statements. We have invited people to engage in a debate with Mr. Dillon. And that. you could very well have done so. But you're now asking a question. It is therefore his right to address your question. Uh, Mr. Dillon, the reference which you made to alcohol 
the Krishna says that it was quoted out of context. The context. Let him read the context. Why read chapter 20 when the chapter is 31? The context, the context is the text that goes with it, before or after. I'm sure you understand simple English. The context is the text that goes with it, not chapter 20, not chapter 1, not book of Genesis. The context. Verse 5, verse 4, verse 3, verse 2, verse 1. Read it in the context. Okay. Verse 4 on through to 6, chapter 31. It is not for kings, O Lamuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert judgment, or pervert judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be heavy of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Right, right, you have done it. You have done it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's telling you that the words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him, what my son and what son of my womb and what son of my vows, do not give strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings. It is not for kings, the rulers. O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine. But the kings must be sober. The kings, the rulers, they must remain sober. The white man in Africa, he must remain sober. The American in America, in Canada, in Australia, the, 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 the Australian rulers of Australia, they must remain sober. Listen, it is not for kings, means rulers, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for prince intoxicating drinks, lest they drink and forget the law. Lest they drink, they are to rule. They mustn't drink. Very good. Good advice. Now, now, verse 6, and give strong drink to him who is perishing. Look, you rulers, you mustn't drink. You're going to rule. How are you going to rule if you are drunk? You mustn't drink, but now you give to those who are perishing, give them. Look, this is in the context. I'm reading in the context. Give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. That is what they're doing in, in South Africa, the black man, in, in Canada, the red Indian, in America, the red Indian, the aborigines of Australia, in, in India. This is what is happening. You see, there is a person who every person ought to believe. He believes in something, right or wrong. There is a type of person who, say, who doesn't believe. He said, I don't believe that there is God. He says, I'm an atheist. Or the guy says, I'm an agnostic. Now, each and every one, according to religion, whether any religion, 
you ought to believe. You ought to believe. If you don't believe, then you are a non-believer. You are against the laws and commandments of God. So as such, you will perish. That person who says there is no God, he is going to perish. The one who says I don't care whether there is or there isn't, he is going to perish. Or you have the wrong concept of God, also you will be punished. According to your understanding, your capacity, your opportunities. There is a type of person who might not have heard the name Jesus. Will God question him? It's unjust, it's unfair. The lunatic, the child, will God question him? Why didn't you believe in my son, Jesus? No. Why didn't you believe in Muhammad? No. You see, each person will be judged according to his understanding, according to his opportunity, his know-how, and the message having reached him or her. So as soon as the message is delivered to you, and you can see, you can see the truth, but for some worldly reasons, maybe to please the family, please my people, please this, please that, you said, no, I will not accept the truth. In other words, the person has already been judged in that case. There is no hope for such a person. But there is a type of person who might be ignorant and had never had an opportunity. Like, like the South Sea Islander. Let's say he never heard about Jesus, he didn't hear about Muhammad, he didn't hear about anything. But he was leading a life according to his norm, according to his standards. God will judge him according to his standards. Not according to the Bible, not according to the Quran. So every person will be judged according to his opportunity and his understanding. Um, my question to Mr. Lila concerns his opinion on a major theme of atonement, that is to say, among the Jews in ancient Israel, they had to slaughter an animal to pay for their sins, the life of the animal was given up. And with Christians, of course, they say that since Jesus was God, his death upon the cross would be atonement for the sins of anyone who believed in him ever. Now in Islam, what is the system for taking away a person's sin? What is the system of atonement I would like to know? Good. Very nice. See, in Islam, no sheep or goat or cow, the slaughtering of an animal can take away your sins. No slaughtering of a human being, good or bad, can take away your sins. Nobody dies for your sins. Each and every individual is personally responsible for his or her doings. Whatever you do, you pay for it. Good or bad, you will be rewarded or you will be punished. Nobody pays for somebody else's sins. In Islam, the way to come right with God is to believe that there is God and listen to his commandments. What he tells you to do, you do, you are on a good wicket. You are in his good books. You listen to his commandments. He says, you shall worship none but me. But he said, no, no, I'll worship you through this man or through this monkey or through this elephant. He said, look, I don't want it. I want you to worship me and me alone. But he said, no, 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 you see, this thing helps me. This makes it easy for me. God says, I don't want it. So in other words, in Islam, you believe in God and carry out his commandments. And if you have made a mistake, you repent. Repent means you turn back from whatever you have done. And this is exactly what the Bible is teaching. In the book of Ezekiel, we are told, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Whoever sins, he will perish. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Whatever the good thing the good man does, he will get the benefit. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn, repent, come back, from all the sin that he has committed, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That is Islam. Same. There is no change. In the laws of God, there is no change. You must pay for your sins, I pay for mine. Nobody can pay for your sins. And nobody dies for your sins. And Christ didn't die for anybody's sins. He didn't die. Thank you, Thank you very much. Today we meet today that uh, on our nothing about the Quran, 
All I want you to know was just to collect at the, the epic of creation when, when the Lord God created heaven and earth like Genesis or not. There are so many things which are common between the Jews, the Christians and the Muslims. This, the Bible speaks about God creating the heavens and the earth in six days. The Quran says God Almighty created the heavens and the earth and all between in six days. Right. So there is a common denominator between what the Jews believe, the Christian believes and the Muslim believes. But it doesn't go right through and through. You see, it doesn't. The concept that is given about God, the Quran doesn't confirm. That when Adam and Eve, when they act of that forbidden fruit, they became aware of their nakedness. And they heard the footsteps of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. You know, like a mighty big giant, boom, boom like mighty King Kong, walking in the cool, in the garden in the cool of the day. So Adam went and hid himself away in the bushes. I'm giving you reference from the Bible, book of Genesis. He hid himself away in the bushes. So God comes and stands where Adam was a few seconds before, and he scans, and he asks, he shouts, he says, Adam, Adam, where art thou? Creates the impression that God didn't know where Adam and Eve were. Or he was playing hide and seek with Adam and Eve. Adam, Adam, where art thou? So Adam peeps through the bushes and he says, I'm here. He said, why are you behaving like this? He said, no, I'm naked. He said, how do you know that you're naked? You were not supposed to know. So he says, you see, you have been eating of the fruit. So Adam says, it's a woman that thou gave us to me, she made me to eat. And you woman, she said, it is the serpent that beguiled me. Now all that thing is not in the Quran, it's not in Islam. This is all in the Bible. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi I mean, uh, Mr. Dida, Dr. Suraj mentioned uh, two things. One about fasting, about Muslim people who um, fast and they made a mockery of it. Could you clarify that as well, please? And uh, let's take one question, Mr. Sal. Please read out that first question again slowly. Basically, it's, I can't remember exactly what Dr. Suraj said, but he was making a mockery about fasting. We Muslim fast, but as he as he entered, he said he used to fast. He was fasting and praying himself. So I just want to all the Christian brothers to know that Muslim people we we fast. I could be partially. What was that? The whole thing? We having difficulty. It's all like Ramadan thing like on the stage. Oh, Dr. Saraj, actually, yes, Dr. Shiroj, yes. Saraj actually stated that uh, it was insulting Muslim people about Ramzan, Ramadan, that we fast. Yes. But as he entered the stage, he himself said that he fast and he was praying. So he basically contradicting what you're saying. I just wanted to know all the other brothers to know that. And your question is? It's just to clarify the people about fasting. Yes, so where do I fit in now? I think what Dr. Shorosh was trying to insinuate was that the Muslims, they fast, but at the end of the day, they gorge themselves. So what is the value of fasting? That, is, that was his criticism. I don't think it was to say that we shouldn't fast. Because Jesus Christ told his disciples that when you fast, do not fast as the hypocrites do. They don't wash their faces, they don't brush their hair. You see, with unkempt hair, milk muck in their eyes. And if you meet one of those guys in the flesh, he said, what's wrong, uncle? He said, no, I'm fasting. He said, no, you don't do like that. You wash your face and you brush your hair. Nobody knows that you're fasting, but you must fast on a higher level. We Muslims are also supposed to do the same. But not to gorge ourselves to the extent that some of us, human weakness, we do. But they do fulfill things which the Christians don't do at all. Yes, sir. Mr. Didat, you've been telling us. Sorry, yes. Mr. Didat, you've been 
telling you a speech today about the contradictions of the Bible. That's very good. Secondly, you were saying about the fact that the Bible hasn't lived up to its contents. That's fine as well. That's one side of the story, but can you scientifically show some facts from the Quran, from the Quran to show that the Quran is a revelation from God, re revelation from God, please? That would be ideal for the Muslims and the non-Muslim brothers. Yes. You see, there are so many things in the Quran which lends itself to scientific discoveries and proving of creation. For example, you see, if you meet one of these young men or learned people, those who say that there is no God, it's one of the answers to the previous question. Huh? Now it depends on the type of person that you are meeting, you can use the type of facts that you have at your disposal. You meet a man of learning, a doctor, a professor of astronomy, biology or whatever, and yet he says that there is no God. And when you ask him, according to his learning, the origin of this universe, how did this universe come into being? And that person will postulate, he's going to start explaining to you that you see millions and millions of years ago, billions of years ago, this universe was one piece. And there was a big bang. And out of that big bang, that explosion, this universe came into being and things started moving in space and they have been ever since moving at a regular pace. So that type of a person, we might ask, he said, now, where did you get this idea from? When did you learn this about the Big Bang? He said, no, yesterday. Because 50 years is yesterday in the history of man. 50 years is only like yesterday. So he discovered that there was a Big Bang according to our astronomers, according to our physicists, and out of that this universe came into being. So he said, you see, an illiterate man in the desert, 1,400 years ago, he couldn't have known that, could he? So he says, no, never. So he says, well, listen. Now we quote the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, Awalam yara lazina kafaru. Do not the unbelievers see? These atheists, these agnostics, those who say that there is no God, can't they see? Awalam yara lazina kafaru. Anna samawati wal arda kanat aratkan. That the heavens and the earth were joined together as one unit of creation. Fatak nahuma. And he split them asunder. And the biologist, you ask him, where does life originate? He said, in the sea, in the water, in the maya. Where did you get that from? He said, no, it's our discovery. When did you make the discovery? He said, yesterday. Because 50 years is yesterday in the history of man. So an illiterate man in the desert, he couldn't have known this. He said, never. Well, listen. Allah tells us through Muhammad, He said, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ And He has made from water every living thing. أَفَلَا يُمِنُونَ Will you then not believe? You atheist, you agnostic, you man of science, will you not believe? He said, look, where did Muhammad get all these ideas from? Plant life, animal life, vegetable life, vegetable, every life, he says, has got pears. 1400 years ago, in the desert, this man is talking. Where did he get the idea from? He says, Subhana lazi khalaq al azwaja kullaha. He says, Glory be to God who has created mates of everything. Imma tumbitul ardu, of that which the earth produces. Wa min anfusikum, and from among yourselves, of the animal kingdom. Wa mimma la yalamun, and of the things that you know not. Male, female, positive, negative, is has created mates of everything, of the things that you know and of the things that you don't know. So these are for people with eyes, with sins, they can see that this is not the work of Muhammad. An illiterate man in the desert could never have been able to utter these things. It is from the source of creation who has been giving it to him, that this is the book of God. Ladies and gentlemen, we unfortunately have just about a minute left of question time. All good things have to come to an end, so we can only accommodate one further question. 
Mr. Didan, I have the impression that my question has been misunderstood. I didn't want to challenge you or to hurt you. I just wanted to ask you for some advice for a person who doesn't believe. I just wanted also to ask you for advice because I am not a believer. I would like and I really want to believe in Islam. But I just want some advice. Yes, sir. Uh Do you not feel that there was sufficient advice, Tim? Do you require further advice? Yeah, because I didn't, I didn't have the impression that my question has oh, been really understood. So you want to know what the bases yeah. are or what the reasons are for a person to actually believe yeah, in one which God? Reasons, which yes. advice would you give to a yes. person who is a non-believer? See, number one, we have to realize that there is a necessity for belief. If you don't believe, you can't move an inch. You can't bat an eyelid. We believe. The very fact that you believe that if you come there, stand before the mic, and when you utter the words, the words will reach me. If you didn't believe, you wouldn't have taken that step. If you didn't believe that you will be visiting this hall and listening to a lecture, you wouldn't have come. So belief is fundamental, is basic to any move that you make. Now, without belief, believe in what? That there is a creator. Number one, that somebody made this machine. Man, woman, he made it and that this machine is not given without instructions. Every machine carries with it instructions. Never mind how simple that mechanism is, you get instructions, your washing machine, your hair dryer, your motor car, anything, everything, you need a book of instructions. This most complicated mechanism, the human being, created and left without instructions, he says, no, he has to be given instructions. And God Almighty, we believe that there is a creator, and this creator through his messengers, one of us, he has been conveying those messages to us, directions, instructions to us. Whether those instructions remain in the pristine purity or not, that is something that is now debatable. But the instructions were given, and it is through those instructions alone can man find ethics, can man find morality. Without these instructions, there is no ethics and there is no morality. Man, being an animal by nature, he will behave like animals. It's only because you believe that there is a creator, and this creator said that thou shalt not marry your mother, you will not marry your sister, you will not marry your daughter. We say, we believe, we believe, we believe. You say, no, I don't believe, then the person is nothing better than the animal. See, the dogs and pigs, the way they behave, they say, well, I behave they're just the same because I'm an animal also. So you have to believe. But now what are you going to believe? Where is the source of, of, of that belief, instructions, which is not contaminated, which is not spoiled? In the origin we say all prophets of God, all messengers of God were divinely ordained. But the messages, because they were not preserved, God sent messengers after messengers, messengers after messengers. This is his way to rectify his creation. And in that system of sending messengers to mankind, Muhammad was the last, the culminating point in that messengership. And he left with us this book. And if you read this book with an unprejudiced mind, if you haven't got one, I can present one to you if you haven't got it. This is an English translation of that book, the Quran, with an index, anything that you want to know. You want to know about God, open G, God, more than 140 different references that you say, I can't believe in God. So he reasons with you. This God of the Quran doesn't say, I'll fix you up and I'll twist your nose and I'll, you know, I'll put your pull out. No, no, no. He says, Awalam yara lazina kafaru. He says, how can you not believe in God? He says, kaifa takfuruna billah. So how can you not believe in Allah? Wa kuntum amwatan. Seeing that you were non-existent, you were dead, and he brought you into being. Thumma yumitukum, and will cause you to die. Thumma yuhyikum, and will bring you back to life again. Thumma ilayhi turja'oon, and to him will be your return. So if you start reasoning, and you see how true the statements are, that you were non-existent. You, I, everybody, non-existent. The men of science will tell you that this earth was a molten mass. Billions of years, you know, there was nothing on this earth, no life. The thing was all boiling, boiling, boiling. And the vapors went up and came down, and the vapors went up and came down, and over a period of millions of years, it started to cool. And then life started to germinate, and so on and so on. So there was a time when mankind was non-existent, and God brought you into being. 
Very true. And now you're going to die. But that is not the end. That you now, there is something in you, which is other than the body, that real you, now that real you, which is the driver of this body of yours, will be made to account for your actions. It's only natural that this person, like Hitler, look, he got away with it. He incinerated six million Jews. On account of him, 40 million people died in the Second World War. He's just going to get off spot free. If he says, no, I don't believe, then there's nothing there on the other side. That means he's free, finish. No, no, no. He will have to account for his deeds. Everyone will have to account for his or her deeds. It is a natural, you know, sequence of our attitude and behavior. And this book explains all that. If you haven't got one, this book is yours. If you haven't got one. You got it? Thank you, the other members of the audience for attending.